James Broughton was a red-tailed hawk over the Mendocino Highlands. James Broughton looks out at the sea on the western slope of Mount Tamalpais. James Broughton was a mystic poet rising with the tides. Well, he, he came, he's sort of like Kenneth Rexroth, who's another great poet who was, uh, Rexroth was sort of a father figure to the Beats. James was as well. Because they're, you know, they're older and they're not older. They're actually, uh, Rexroth was born in 1907, so he's a few years older than Burroughs. James is a year younger than Burroughs. But Burroughs had met Ginsburg and Kerouac in the, in the early 40s, and, and that, was, that was the Beat generation until Gregory Corso became part of it. And this is all journalese, but it's all very true. And then, and then Howl happens, and On the Road comes out, and then Naked Lunch, and they got all the attention. And James, James will continually be rediscovered as this almost kind of, kind of golden secret of West Coast Bohemia. From people I know where their negative reactions to James's poetry reviews, I've never read a review that, that wasn't positive. Um, I would just say that, that the poetry probably didn't get the recognition it should have gotten. And I told you the reasons earlier why I thought that's embedded very deeply in the West Coast. And uh, it's very much out of the out of a kind of out of the um, stream of Charles Olson and the Black Mountain School of Poets and and actually even of the beat poets it's its own thing so like again that theme that that, that you mentioned earlier follow your weird follow your own weird that was James again I mean the more I think about it the nursery rhyme the mother gooseness of it all um, and the whimsy um, the comic element, it just didn't fit the beat thing all that much. <clears throat> and yet, you know, McClure, Michael McClure, uh, loved his poetry. Um, Ferlinghetti loved his, um, certainly published his autobiography at City Light, sort of the, the main organ of the, of the beats. Um, but I think he was a little distant from the, from the, the big drum beat of the whole thing. And mean? and I think he wanted to, well I mean I mean that his poetry is radically different from all those others. Uh, it's political, but not in the not in the sense of like Ginsburg could be pl political with a poem like Plutonium Old, where one of the early McClure poems on the death of one hundred um, uh, seals, you know, um, one hundred whales, and and. Uh, Diane de Prima with her revolutionary letters. You don't get that in James Broughton. But you do get the, 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 um, the absolute necessity to be yourself, no matter what your sexuality is or how you think. So I think it's like the way a lot of people talked about Bukowski in the 60s. Um, Bukowski... Um, published in a magazine in New Orleans called The Outsider. I think James Broughton is one of those, there's many poets like that. He was an outsider's outsider. And also there's a term I came up with a while back, under the underground. Now he certainly wasn't obscure. Everybody knew James Broughton, but I just don't think he, he wasn't um, getting the attention that a lot of the, the beat poets had. And he also put a, so much of his energy, in, again, into the filmmaking. And as I said earlier, that's sort of the bedrock of his reputation are those incredible films. Okay, so I mentioned James's angel that visited him as a child, right? You know about that, the vision of an angel. And, you know, angels have been, what, they've always been with us, probably. We've been... We, demons and angels, you know, the both sides of our being. Um, so I wrote this, um, actually thinking of the fact you were coming and, and, and thinking of the angel, I call it the angle of the angel. <clears throat> I am lost in a canyon far from home, 
Hear the ferns drip with sweat from prehistoric tombs, elk brush against the lower cliff. Stop and listen to footsteps of fallen gods. Smile when he reaches for your groin, silent body, blue earth, red soil, from which all justice measures the meaning we offer to the land where we are condemned to abide. The angel of the angel's wing, his lips touch my cheek. I turn in a tide pushed by sea breaks. I go down the salt steps to his chamber of anemones and oval gray agate. He grabs the bitter joy of fingers and flesh. His woman is a leopard on my tongue. If I do not speak, he may vanish with the emerging light. I feel it through the blinds and hear engines of light. All night long I held his body in my garden of lilac. I crept along the ridges of his sleeping eyes below the constellations. He taps my shoulder when the water rises. We walk up the cliff and touch sails half buried in fog banks. Strange dreamers flank us and say nothing. The decades are reborn in the mine of memory. I know whenever I travel, it is for the log I keep in this cabin where lanterns burn across the night. So that's my latest poem, and that's sort of a, you know, Broughton-esque in the sense that there's the angel, there's the weaving your love for a person into the love for the land <clears throat> so that one invades the other, or my language is one invites the other into full being. And the idea of the log is that you're on a ship and the cabin is actually a cabin on the sea, which in reality isn't true, but you put yourself there. Well, I, th I feel my, like that poem is a journal of how I've been feeling. So, so uh, no, I don't really keep a journal. I'm, I'm not, uh, I know he, he did and it helped with in, in a long undressing. And now that I'm writing my own memoir, memoir I wish I had kept a journal. Because I have, I have a five days worth of journal from 77 and it was fascinating for me at least to look at. But no, I don't, I don't do that. I know he, he, he did a lot of, of course, uh, prose writing that's unpublished. And a lot of that are the, the journals would be a fascinating thing to see in print considering all the people he knew, you know, and all the, all the uh, California-esque things that he was involved in, like being there with Alan Watts on Tamil Pius. And he had a, you know, I, I have this vision of James and his, his kind of, um, young filmmaker group in the 40s, for God's sake, after the war, what that must have been like. Because San Francisco and the Bay Area was a much different place then. And the cable cars were really, and I actually came here, they still were play, things you used. They were a nickel and you went on them and you actually went to work on them like I did. Now they're simply a tourist attraction. And then they were still with the old cable system that was done in the early part of the century, by now it's some kind of newfangled thing that makes them work, and and then there were, there was the, there were great markets in the city, and uh, um, the all the cafes, all the dry, everything was it's all over the country that way. But San Francisco was a working class city then, and it isn't anymore. It was a much different place. And what was that like for these people? You know, today we 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 tend not to think of that. Uh, so that milieu was much different. And there weren't as many poets. Now there's a poet on every corner in the city. So, um, yeah, in that sense. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just know he, you know, you know, he, he was a older man who liked younger men, it seems to me. And I can relate to that, you know, and as much of my life was that way as well. And uh, he was with Joel Singer, who was uh, 
many years his junior. And I know I saw recently the, um, I had sort of an understanding, a little bit of an understanding of, of James and his relationship with Joel from seeing Christopher Isherwood, uh, the movie on Isherwood with um, with Don Bacardi. But there was a bigger gulf of years, I think, between them. And um, James and Joel collaborated together on films in, in many great ways, and Joel had his certainly had his own artistic life, uh, making collages and things. But also, this loving way he... There was a time in which James didn't have many books in print, and Joel got books in print and got them circulated and uh, that kind of thing. So that kind of relationship was really interesting. I saw them as, interestingly enough, as, as peers from the outside. I didn't spend all that much time with them, but from the outside, it looked to me like they were they were peers, and that's possible when the when the older person um, is able to understand the wisdom of of the youth, because the youth always understands the wisdom of the older person. Of I mean, a sense of a sensible younger person does, and and because James always had that sounds almost corny, but right up to the end, he always had that youthful spirit, even when he was in his own terms, packing up for paradise in the last couple of years. And even when he was like skin and bones, the 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 uh, radiance shone through. It, it reminded me of a Dylan song, which has the refrain, and stay forever young. Doesn't mean to worship youth. It means to just have that the suppleness of a young mind. That's all, I think that's all it really means. <clears throat> I say that as a person sliding into early old age, so I got to say that. Well, that could be a funny question. What did James get from his relationship to, with Joel? Well, you know, he got a companion, a young, vital, good-looking guy, you know. So there's that aspect to it, you know. But uh, as I said, he helped James um, get the books in print and get them out there. And, uh, you know, the, the Broughton universe is important. And, hey, you really got to work. You really got to keep this going, I hope I'm not, this is too much supposition. I don't think so. Uh, and um, I think it helped make James run a lot faster. When it, I mean, he's mentioned that. He did mention that to me. It helped him, in, in different terms, but it helped him run a lot faster as an older person. What if he hadn't met Joel? What if he'd been alone? It's one thing to consider, you know. So it's like, you know, and when you're older like that and, you, and you're with the younger person, I don't think you don't necessarily think of the person as your son, but there is something like that. But as I said earlier, it was, it was a real, to me, they were like, ultimately like peers. Joel is not a young kid. He's somebody in his 30s when they meet and then in his 40s and I think on into his 50s and he's a maturing person. And um, there certainly wasn't any sense of competition between them, which was great to see. It was, um, Joel was like James, a very positive thinking person. I don't know where James went for the midnight of the soul, because I'm sure he did, but I, didn't, I never saw that. I saw the more public. People don't admit that, that those early stories, they're, they're actually, they're not nice stories. They're violent. It's sort of like yeah, you know, I have I have a line. We don't condone violence, but we hear it. So when we were little kids, we had these, you know, my generation and James's generation, and and maybe in other ways now, um, Grimm's fairy tales, Mother Goose. There's the, um, you know, there's the story of um, Little Red Riding Hood. That's that's got a lot of violence in it. Um, I don't know, there's the one about the mouse hitting the cat, the cat eating the mouse, stuff like, I, I, I don't remember exactly, but, but they're, they're hard. And I think Rexroth, Kenneth Rexroth, who was very close to Kenneth, uh, I mean, very close to James, a little bit older, just five or six years, but they were close for many, many years. And he certainly loved James's poetry. I remember he did write about that once. He was commenting on, on that aspect of, of the Broughton um, ouvre, if you will, um, that he went in that direction. And 
that's why I say he's he was political, but in a very subtle way, just by by trying trying to help free people to think in 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 new and different ways. So I think that's probably what he meant by weird. Well, I think that that playfulness that that you find in his work, um, I think for a whole generation of younger gay poets, he had a tremendous influence. It, it's it's really it's really difficult in a way to for me to answer that. Um, and I said he had an influence on me, the dispensation to be a little freer in my my own thinking about sexuality you know i found that also in john wieners and in allen ginsburg and, and several other writers and then if you really start probing it you find it in catullus from two thousand years before as actually um or in plato in in the in the socratic dialogues but for our time that had that had a lot of meaning i think that uh, james's influence is much more subtle and much more behind the scenes than John Wieners or Ginsburg, uh, let's say. Certainly Ginsburg's influence is, is so huge because of the, of, the, of the tidal wave of the beats that's still washing on shore. You know, uh, with James, it's, it's something else. And you'd have to say that his influence um, in the uh, experimental film movement on the West Coast, I would say more than the East is is very profound. I say that because I've talked to a lot of younger experimental filmmakers from the East, and and they really, some of them don't. James isn't necessarily in their constellation, but he's very much so on the West Coast. Well, he he came. He's sort of like Kenneth Rexroth, who's another great poet who was uh, Rex Roth was sort of a father figure to the Beats. James was as well. Because they're, you know, they're older and they're not older. They're actually, uh, Rex Roth was born in 1907, so he's a few years older than Burroughs. James is a year younger than Burroughs. But Burroughs had met Ginsburg and Kerouac in the, in the early 40s, and, and that, was, that was the Beat generation until Gregory Corso became part of it. And this is all journalese, but it's all very true. And then, and then Howl happens, and On the Road comes out, and The Naked Lunch, and they got all the attention. And James, James will continually be rediscovered as this almost kind of, kind of golden secret of West Coast Bohemia. And those three people come from the East, and they have East Coast energy, and they had uh, East Coast connections. I'm mean, Burroughs never lived here. Um, Kerouac was out here a little bit. He wrote Big Sur about being at Ferlinghetti's cabin on the Big Sur coast. That's sort of James Broughton territory. And he wrote The Subterraneans about North Beach. Um, and October, The Railroad Earth is actually a West Coast thing. But his main thing is the East or the broad American road a la Thomas Wolfe. Um, and Ginsburg, even though he wrote Howell on the West Coast, it's all New York imagery. James is strictly California. So in, in that sense, James is provincial. That doesn't mean that James isn't as great a poet. It doesn't mean that at all. It's just more provincial. So am I. I'm a West Coast person. That's the way I see it. It just, the world still works that way, despite the internet and despite a certain flattening out of things, at least that's the way I see it. That California is provincial. That, that's the way I mean it, if you exclude Hollywood. But that, I was saying as a filmmaker, he's more, his influence is felt here more than the East. Uh, and as a poet, I think that's very true. There are people here who write like the East. And so there, it's an interesting thing. Interesting phenomenon. So, so James is like Mount Tamil Pius, you know. It's just, it's just, un, you know, it's it's unpretentious, and yet, so anyone who sees it from anywhere in the world, you take people on Tamil Pius, it's guaranteed to knock their eyes out the way it slopes down to the ocean. That kind of thing. 
It's much different than going and seeing the Empire State Building in New York or something like that. I'll read a selection from, this is a Wong Undressing, which is, he had many collected poems, but Wong Undressing is collected poems 49 to 69. Um, and there's a section of it called Soundings from the Shore. <clears throat> and there's a great poem, um, I Ask the Sea, Conversations at Mendocino. And for people who aren't from California, Mendocino is a county north of San Francisco, a couple counties up. And uh, while it works its way inland, it's mainly known for the town of Mendocino on the coast. And uh, this wild, rugged, uh, coastline, um, and then going inland, very heavily forest, very sparsely populated. So James grows up in the Central Valley, but he spends so much of his life here in the city and in Marin. And in both places, you're on peninsula, and you got the sea on three sides. And he spent a lot of time in Stinson Beach. So he loved the shore, and he and he loved that coming together of the of the uh, sea and the land. So I'll read a, a good chunk of I Ask the Sea. And I'll try and read it in my own voice because I hear James whispering in my ear. I asked the sea how deep things are. Oh, said she, that depends upon how far you want to go. Well, I have a sea in me, said I. Do you have a me in you? I'll look, said the sea, but that's apt to go rather deep. And she broke a wave over my foot. I asked the sea how to cope with my life. Yes, she said, yes. No, no, said I. I want to know how to be strong like you. Yes, she said, yes, kissing the arms of the cross. I took a morning glory down to the sea at sunrise and laid it at my, her feet. But the day darkened and stormed. A gift should not be niggardly. Remember that imperial manner who chopped off his finger and tossed it overboard. Tomorrow I must take my heart. The world, I said, chirps a roratorio of meaningless questions and wrong answers. Isn't there somewhere a quiet place? Yes, said the sea, in the eye of the hurricane. Why are you so restless, said I to the sea. I'm calmer than you, said she. The wind and the moon like to toss me about, but myself I do nothing at all. I accept whatever comes, and everything comes to me. How do you manage that, said I. Oh, she replied, I have rather a good digestion. Why are you always going in and out? I asked the sea. Why don't you just stay put? I'm not a puddle or a bush, said sea. Furthermore, I only go out in order to come in again. Nothing goes forward without first going back. Old Mother Sea, I pray you, you who absorb and reflect all the collected ponders, have I another think coming? I confess the wrongs of my head. I repent its thoughtless motions. Have you a tonic brainwash? I am ready to mind my change. O oh, lady of another thing coming, have you a fresh profundity to help me launch and pilot the homeward voyage of my ark? Let's talk of my dead, the sea said. Let's not, said I. I'm dry on my dune. But what of the drown, the sea boomed. Their ghosts I know, said I on the sand, as I know my own doom. Then, said the sea, when I wash up the dead, will you wade in? I'll swim, I said. Wading in the surf, I saw in the oncoming wave a coal of fire ablaze like the very eye of the deep. I plunge and reach out. 
When I found my feet again, I clutched in the dripping air a rose-colored tennis shoe, said the sea in my ears. Love is the element, flowing and burning is the fire in which you swim. So that's the first section of that poem. Wow. And you see, it's got it's got a lot of the it's got sort of a, like sort of like a sub nursery rhyme kind of whimsy to it. He's whimsical, and 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 the words are light on the page. At least that's the way I see it. And they're, it's somber but also light and very inviting, and very musical, lyrical but but lyrical musical. A lot of darkness. Well, that's what that's what Rex Roth had said about the nursery rhyme. They're, they're they're guaranteed to be dark. You know, Mother Goose is. You know, Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Um, I remember James and I reading that together. Not all the king's horses or all the king's men could put poor Humpty together again. There you go. And that's you know somebody's always getting bumped in the head or in the ass or whatever in Mother Goose and certainly in. Grimm's fairy tales are aptly named, even though they're G-R-I-M-M. -M. I mean, it's, it's a German name, but they're Grimm. Well, I had told him a story about, I knew this very eminent law professor. He's actually a professor of Talmudic law and, uh, and, and also a, um, also a, um, a scholar of, of Jewish history named David Dauba, who taught at Bolt Law School, former fellow... Um, at Cambridge University in England. And one day I said to him, and he lived in North Beach amid the squalor of Broadway, which is the Broadway girly strip in North Beach, him and his wife, uh, of all places where this distinguished professor lived, I said, and he's from Germany originally, he fled the Nazis. I said, David, I wish that I'd been a scholar. He said, Neely, I wish I had been a poet. And then he read Humpty Dumpty to me and said, I remember reading that to my kids, and I've never been able to, to figure that poem out. What a wonderful thing. And I told that story to James, and he just thought it was so wonderful. And I actually wanted him to meet Dauba, but I just was unable to arrange that meeting. So, you know, the intersection of the two would have been, would have been great, especially because Dauba had that understanding of, of, of what whimsy can really mean. Well, I, you know, we talked about his touching. We were, we were going up to, a, to, it was kind of funny. I'm in the backseat of this car, and he kept reaching to hold my hands. I believe Joel was driving, and, you know, he's just that way. He wanted to talk while holding hands. And, and, and I had to lean, I remember leaning forward, and my back is aching, and we're going around these turns, and I'm having to, and he just wouldn't let go. And, and you know, just it's surprising the way, so he's holding on to me, but he's also so deeply engaged in the conversation. Um, so if you can call that surprising, just you know, rivers of thinking coming out of him and not needing to sound profound. Um, and you know, that's something about Bohemia. And the, the more I think about it, because we had been talking earlier about, you know, where do you place James? And uh, there's this whole beat constellation, the beat poets he had to deal with, that he is this, this, he was this incurable California-based bohemian. Again, much, much like his contemporary Kenneth Rexroth, who's a very great poet, a great poet of nature. And, 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 and I said, just like reading from that poem, that's one of the things about James. He was a, a great poet of nature. And, and a lot of people don't realize that. It's, it's hard not to be when you grew up in 1914 in California, much like William Eberson, who was born a year later than James and uh, grew up in the Central Valley and, and uh, became Brother Antoninus uh, for much of his life and then, and then forsook the Catholic thing and became William Eberson again. This, this deep intertwining sense of the uh, intertwining the twining the land and, and your spirit together that's what James did and that's what happened with his sexuality finally he wove it into the land so that um, I'm reminded of when we when he died in, in 1999 one of the things about having older friends and older poet friends you know they're apt to die before you and 
and we we uh, to think that I just was reading from this poem, and we threw his ashes, we tossed his ashes, let's say, into the sea, and you know what a what a perfect thing to know that James is floating out there, you know. Uh, the dark side of James. Um, I would say, no, I don't think so. You know, again, I mean, I spent time with James that, that was more public. I think that when he wasn't publishing so much, I saw a need for it. I felt the need, which we all have as poets. You know, I, I mean, I can relate to this. I remember thinking, you know, but he's an older guy. And <clears throat> without reading too much into it, and without making too big a deal out of it, I've always wondered how he felt about, like Rex Roth, these guys coming from elsewhere. And and we mentioned that earlier, the beats coming in, and he gets ingested in that, but he's really a little earlier than that. And uh, not getting all the public fanfare and accolade that they had. I always felt with the film world that, that, that all that film work kind of sustained him in that sense because that was always there um, in a different way than the poetry, in a more, in, somehow in a more solid way for his reputation. You know, I'm James Broughton and I helped start this whole movement of, I guess you say underground, but I say sort of outsider films. Uh, and we weren't dependent. We weren't dependent on Hollywood. We weren't looking for that. We were uh, doing something else. And uh, I think that was his bedrock, uh, a, a kind of a thing. I saw him yearn after some guys, quotes around guys, you know, dudes, a few times, and uh, not get their attention maybe the way he wanted. And I could relate to that too. So that's sort of, those are just whispers, I guess, of... Uh, but I have no great sensational thing to report on that level. Well, I just remember how, you know, it's it's, it's humorous to, to have this bed on this hillside running away with itself. And it's, it's sort of like a uh, weird chaplain. When you mentioned, you know, what, what was the phrase he used? About, follow your own weird. Uh, follow your own weird, you know. Well, he certainly, maybe he meant follow that bed, you know. He followed his own weird in that film, but it, but it was Chaplin esque um, in that in that sense of like Chaplin's. I, I always thought that Chaplin's waddling down the road at the end of so many movies, you know, with the bowler hat on, and there's the bed wobbling down the hillside, and, and he's able to make this. And then the bed, the, the whole symbolism of what a bed is. You, you expect the bed to be inside and to be stationary. So the bed becomes part of the natural world and, and it's thrust upon the slope. And uh, that's sort of what I remember about it. It's a high slapstick as well, you know. And, and, and some of the later films have more of a somber quality to them. Well, I can see that again, that, that sense of that movement of it just, it, it weirded people out. It was, you know, in a good way, I mean, it was really something. Oh, it's a great, it's a great seminal film. I think it's, I think it's something. I mean, I've talked to a younger filmmaker from L.A. It, it influenced him. This is just a couple of weeks ago. And I said you should see the later films, the, the Sri Lanka film, and some of the others where they're they're out in nature. He and Joel. Um, really fascinating work. Well, you know. Like I like I said that that sense of James is way out there. That's part of being weird, and uh, it's it's funny. It's like throwing the bed out there on the hill. It's like almost like a kind of yeah. yeah I just I don't want to read too much into this. I don't want to be scholarly, but almost a almost a rootlessness. You know, I haven't thought about it this way. Um, I haven't I haven't written on a film, and I I a film for me has a different um, you know you know people who write about it could could really talk about it more but it's it's really that chaplain-esque kind of 
whimsy that that I love about it. It would almost rob it for me to say much more. I'll have to look at it again and slide down the hill again. Well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, in my new book of poems, I went through and counted how many times I used the word dead, death, dying. It's in a 70-page book, it's about 30 times I started changing the word in some of the poems. Um, she's dead becomes she's gone. Um, uh, he died became he left. And it's not a matter of sanitizing, it's a matter of not boring the reader, you know, but but you look at Dylan Thomas and three quarters of his poems are probably about death, certainly his most famous poems. <clears throat> and death shall have no dominion. Uh, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rage at end of day. After the funeral, a refusal to mourn, the death by fire of a child in London. There's four right there. Those are arguably his most famous poems. I mean, there are some, you know, there, there's some others, but those are four of the most famous poems, and they, the death is in the title. And um, poetry is a hedge against dying, just like art is. You do it, you do it to affirm life, but you do it to achieve immortality, both in the level of just the writing of it itself, and it twines you with the earth, with the grass. That's why Whitman has leaves of grass. He's binding himself to the grass. And he writes in memories of President Lincoln, ever returning spring, Trinity sure to me you bring of lilacs um, in the western night. I mean, he's, he's affirming the regeneration. And I think that that's what poetry is about. And then the sense that your words may live beyond you in a book or an anthology or people reading them. <clears throat> so poetry is a large, poetry is pro it's probably 50-50 life and death that's what i think having been a poet for so many years myself that's what it's about james broughton was a great bohemian soul james broughton was a wanderer on mount tamil pious james broughton lived with joy james broughton loved to listen to the sound of the sea james broughton loved the boys <coughs> James Broughton was a filmmaker, poet, raconteur, party maker, party goer. James Broughton was a center of the creative life in San Francisco. <clears throat> James Broughton was a torrent of luscious words. James Broughton's skip through the rhymes. James Broughton hid in the fairy tale. James Broughton peeked out from between the redwood trees. Now I said that one because we had gone to Muir Woods and I remember him peeking out between the trees. Again, that sense of play that he had. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, um, that's funny because that's, that's what Joel shared with him. I mean, how could I have been with them in their intimate moments? But I could see that. I could see there was a lot of joy. And I'm sure that in his darker moments that Joel was there for him. I mean, I know that. And um, I do remember something we asked about the darker side. I remember when the books came out because, you know, like the City Lights books, I remember, you know, wishing that there was, so happy to have the books out, but you know, wishing there was more to it than getting them out, more publicity, more this and that. He made a couple of comments now and then, and that's just a very nat natural thing to want. Now this film's being made, and maybe he's peeking through the clouds now and, and happy about that. <laughs>